Let's get into our study in the book of Galatians. We're going verse by verse through the book of Galatians, and we left off in verse number 27 of chapter 3. Um, we did get into it. <clears throat> I saw Krista's notes. She, she keeps meticulous notes, so I appreciate that. And, and, and where we left off was in chapter 3, verse 27. So let's read those, uh, let's read those three verses to end that chapter. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time tonight. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his life given to us on Calvary's cross where we receive forgiveness of sins, Father, and everlasting life as a free gift today by grace through faith plus no works. Thank you for the Holy Scriptures, Father, uh, the, the, the word of God that we get to study each and every day if we choose and, and also come together, the blessing of coming together with those of like precious faith as we are doing tonight and each Sunday to uh, study your word together. We thank you for this assembly. We thank you for uh, the ability to get this word out to others, the blessing of technology and the labor of our dear brother. And we, we're just happy, Father, <clears throat> and blessed, as the scriptures say, to uh, have access to your holy word. We know there are those who don't have um, uh, access to your word around the world. And so we're thankful. We don't take it for granted. We also thank you for one another in Christ. We know there are others who don't have even one other grace believer to fellowship with. So we uh, appreciate this, this, uh, this blessing of this assembly. And, Father, as we um, look into your holy word tonight, we ask that you give us great understanding and wisdom. Um, this is the living word of God. May it live in our hearts. And most importantly, give us a greater appreciation of your son, your holy son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Um, <clears throat> we left off and we, we saw, look at verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And we saw uh, from Romans chapter 6 that that is a spiritual thing that God the Spirit does. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. It is not water. It is not a ceremony a man does. Okay? It's something that the spirit of God does. We saw that in Colossians chapter 2. Buried with him in baptism. Whereby, whereby we are raised together uh, by the operation, through the operation of God. It's what God does. And when we trust Christ as our Savior... When, what he did at Calvary, when you think of Christ, think about what he did, his suffering at Calvary. When we trust that, we are placed into, we are, the, the, uh, the, the definition of baptism in every case in the scripture is identified with uh, whatever it is, baptized, is to, I, totally identified. And here, we're identified into the body of Christ. Now, what about the body of Christ? Look at verse 28. <clears throat> when it comes to the body of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Those were, those were the, 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 the uh, classification of mankind in Paul's day. There were the Jews, the Gentiles, but he calls them Greeks because Greek was the, that was the term used. In Romans, he talks about to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And although the Roman Empire was there and the Greco Empire, the Greek Empire was before them, it was the, the wisdom of the world was the Greek wisdom. It's down to our day. You see the sororities and fraternities, all these Greek uh, it, that that's the 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 status of the uh, the the wise, okay? Philosophers, right? <clears throat> the philosophers and so forth. Well, that spirit came down even to our day, and whether you were uh, your religion didn't matter, um, your 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 um, whether your 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 Gentile uh, um, um, upbringing and so forth, uh, neither bond nor free. Your your social status, you could have been a, a bond servant. Or free uh, a master it doesn't matter uh, there is neither male nor female the order of creation <clears throat> in every other capacity here on this earth the order of creation man and woman uh, the man and then the woman Adam was first born then Eve but in Christ that doesn't that's not the issue it doesn't mean that those things um, God doesn't acknowledge them now but again when we get I get this question sometimes what happens when we get to the heavenly places. Can a sister in the Lord reign? Sure she can. In fact, there will be sisters in the Lord who suffer for the mystery, who reign with Christ, and brothers in the Lord 
who refuse to suffer in a mystery who won't reign with Christ. There will be sisters who will be joint heirs with Christ and brothers who will be heirs of God but not joint heirs with Christ. They won't reign with them. So it doesn't matter your, 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 whether you're um, uh, the order of creation. Notice in verse 28, for ye are all one, and that's that one body, Ephesians 4, <clears throat> in Christ Jesus. Now, and if ye be Christ, in Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. Remember, when Paul talks about Abraham's seed, a couple weeks ago, go back to chapter, 16, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, go, go up to verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to, excuse me, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. We saw, we, we looked at all those verses a couple weeks ago, that when God made this promise to Abraham and his seed, that seed is in Christ, okay? It's Christ. So go back to verse 29, and if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs, you, you receive an inheritance according to the promise. And that promise, you're the spiritual seed, you have you, he, that promise of everlasting life, okay? He calls it the promise of the Spirit. And when God gave, what God gave to the body of Christ is everlasting life as a free gift. And that's a blessing we receive because we're in Christ, okay? That's why you can't lose your salvation. We get that question a lot. Brother Ryan, can I lose my salvation? No, you're in Christ. And, and what Paul says, you're an heir of God, it's a promise, the promise of the Spirit, and you have everlasting life. Now, what about our walk? Look at, look at chapter number four. Now I say, now this is what Paul is going to instruct us. Now, the body of Christ, dispensation of grace, now I, that's Paul, say, that the heir, now he's going to use what they understood, uh, um, he'll use, uh, he, sometimes Paul uses terminology that the people can look at in, in, in creation uh, as far as man. Notice he says that the heir, that's, that's the, 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 the one who's going to inherit his father's um, goods, the heir, as long as he is a child, he's not a grown-up, okay, he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Um, that child and the servant are treated the same, okay? The child, even though he's, he's lord of all, he will inherit his father's business when he is a child he's not ready to to take on that responsibility the same power status the same power status exactly as a servant and a servant is under when, when you think about a servant think about subservient it means you're under um notice in verse two what are they under but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father i was thinking about that what does a tutor do a tutor trains up the child and a governor restrains you. So the tutor trains and the governor restrains, okay? And you, you're under this system of, of training and restraining. Think about the law. What did the law tell is the children of Israel? Thou shalt do this. So he trained them what to do. And thou shalt not do this. He restrained them. He governed them. So think about the law. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. That's tutors and governors. I have a seven-year-old. We have a seven-year-old. Chris is in here. And we always tell him, Jada Lynn, what to do and what not to do. We have to instruct her, train her. And then my job, we talk about this probably every day with her. Daddy's job is to restrain you, to temper that aggressiveness. Well, the law was that for Israel. Notice in verse 2, it says, Until the time appointed of the Father. You know, I, I was thinking about this in Israel. The father would, how do I say this? The father would say, all right. He would determine at 12 or 13 whether his son was really ready to do his father's business. I think about Paul. Uh, his father was a tent maker, no doubt. Uh, Jesus came upon his stepfather, Joseph, who was a carpenter. They learned a trade in Israel. And his father says, okay, son, around 12 or 13. But I found something interesting just researching it. If the father did not realize, didn't think in his heart that his son was ready at 13, he would wait another seven years to the age 20. Wow. Now, where I think they got that from, in the law of Moses, at age 20, it was when you were considered, um, um, you, were, you were held accountable by God. Let me say it like that. 
under age 20, you were innocent. You had to start doing your own sacrifice. You had to do your own sacrifice according to the law. That's right. Um, the men of war in, 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 in the book of Numbers, God says all the men who are 20 and over have to go to war. Okay, so you're a man. Okay, God did that. So the fathers. But then if, if the father says my son's not ready at 20, they would then go to age 25. Now, what's interesting about age 25 is the priest began their apprenticeship for five years at age 25. And they would be trained up by the older priest who at age 50 would go into what they call senior status. You know, I was, I was listening to somebody, they were talking about the Supreme Court and President Trump, uh, President Trump gets to, uh, uh, you know, give a nominee. And this one guy who, who, was, who was an expert on Supreme Court, he says, Somebody says, what do retired Supreme Court justices do? He says they go into what they call senior status, and many of them go and train up other young judges, teach them what it's like, prepare them for the Supreme Court if they ever had that. And I said, I start thinking, that's what the, the, the priest did in the law. So let's say at age 25, they would be an apprentice. And you, you, you see that in different types of... Uh, you know, uh, skills and labors and so forth. You have an apprentice. And then at age 30, like the Lord Jesus Christ, they would go into full-time ministry, full-time. And from age 30 to 50, that 20-year period would be, that they would be full-time. And at 50, they were ready to, I'm going to quote-unquote, retire from the full-time, but not retire altogether. From age 50 on, I guess till they die, what they would do is they would be available to train all these young, these young men here, the 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 year olds, getting them ready. So it was like a cycle. God was wise because at 50, you know, I guess in that time, that's really old. It's not that old now because I'm approaching that right in a few years. But the point is that 50 getting closer, ain't it there? I'm 44. Now, six years. Anyway. But what did he do? That's still young. So he would take all the wisdom he has and put it into him. And, and, and these years right here, study after study say that around age 30, you're at your prime physical. Now, you're still growing in understanding. 40 is the perfect age, the one that's right in the middle there, right? But 40, your stamina and stuff, you know, you, the average person, your body starts. You can actually feel your body change at 40. We talk about that all the time. It's like you hit 40 and something happened. 80 also. 82. Oh, no. She said 80 also. Now, that's when you're in your prime. 40 is just right there. Because you still have enough, you know, energy, yet you've gained an awful lot of wisdom in life, okay? And then it goes down here. Your, phys your physical goes down, but your, and your mental, you're, you're at your mentally, mental high between 40 and 50. You're still good. But he, the way God did it is he'd have the older priest then go and do that. So if a, if a father says, my son's not ready at 20, you go to 25. Then they said there was another thing in Israel where if he wasn't ready at 25, the father says, nah, my son's not ready. I'm going to confirm him as a son at age 30. Now you can do that. People, people don't realize that when Abraham sacrificed Isaac, Isaac wasn't some little boy. He was a man. He was a man. He was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died as the son of God, he was a man. He was in his early 30s. So Isaac was too. And so the father, let's say that father says, my son's not ready at 25. He, he's getting there, but age 30, then he would say he's a man, okay? Just like the Lord. And when did the, when did the priest start their ministry? At age 30 and for 20 years. By the way, that thing, you can kind of, I've done this before. There's something there. The Lord, the Lord would have ministered for, for 30, just, just his, anyway, I can't even get into it, but there's something significant there with, with, that, with that amount of time, plus one for him, 21 years. Uh, you can kind of, if the dispensation of grace didn't happen, you can kind of see when, when he went up to heaven, when he would come back. You could kind of look at that. It would have spanned from age 30 to 51 like that. He gave him an extra year. Uh, that, that, that parable. And you could tell the time when he would have, he would have returned. I actually think Acts 15, Jerusalem Council, was, was the year that the Lord, had the dispensation of grace not happened, would have come back, okay? But that's another study. All right, look at this. 
when he talks about the time appointed of the Father. Go, go with me to verse number uh, three. Even so we, when we were children, okay, there were some, some at Galatians who were Jews like Paul in time past. When we were ch children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. It has to do with the law and all those principles and, and ordinances. Now, look at verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption, the adoption of sons. Now, I got to break, break it down a little bit. Look at verse 4 again. But when the fullness of the time was come, God is on a time schedule, particularly when it comes to prophecy in the Bible. If you go with me to Mark chapter 1, go to Mark chapter 1. The Lord Jesus shows up to Israel. Go to Mark chapter 1, if you will. Matthew, Mark, chapter number 1. And the Lord Jesus Christ makes this declaration in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Verse yes, verse, let's look at verse 14 and 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after that, this was after he was tempted, everybody. By the way, go back to verse number 9. Yeah. Let's go there. Mark 1, 9. Because you know when it says, and when the fullness of the time was come, and he talks about the time appointed of the Father, you're about to see that happen in the book of Mark with the Lord Jesus. Now, later in Galatians, we're going to go back to the book of Mark when it talks about my title there, crying out the Father. Interesting. Now, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, everybody has to see this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each of them has a theme, okay? We were, talk we were talking on Sunday, Brian asked about this, or somebody asked, uh, maybe it was Toby, was asking about the number four. We were all talking about the number four, and it represents the earth. And yeah, it was Toby, but then Ryan says, you know, that's why there's four Gospels. Well, God I, was, I was asking if that's why there were four trees. Oh, the four trees, that's right. We were talking about the four trees. Oh, thanks, you put, that, put something about the, tree, the trees. And I got some stuff on that for Sunday, that question he asked about the man with the who was walk? He sees. I see men as trees. trees right. We'll look at that Sunday. Right. So Matthew has a theme. It's to show him as uh, the Messiah, the King, right? So he's he's the, he's the King. That's the focus. It says the, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the King. Mark shows him as the suffering servant. Okay. Now we're talking about in, in Galatians. He says. He says. Uh, the heir, as long as he a child, he differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, right? He's going to become a son soon, okay? All right, so that's why we're in Mark. And Luke, Luke shows him what's the picture. Man. That's right, the magnificent man. Okay, he's the magnificent man. That's the focus of Luke, his humanity, right? And then John, all right, we, we're going through John every other Wednesday. We'll say that again. That's right. That's the, the, the son of God or his, his or God, his deity, right? And John obviously means Jehovah is gracious. It brings the grace of God through the new covenant fulfillment to Israel. Now, let me go back to Mark. It, Mark shows him as a servant. So sure, it would be Mark. Show him as a servant where now he's going to be proclaimed by the father as a son. Let's watch it. He's going to go from a servant to a son. Let's look at it. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. Now, everybody watch. He saw this. He saw it. He's the folk. He's looking up there. He's looking for his father's approval. Here we go. Verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am what? Well, please. Now, look at this. 
In other passages, it says, this is my beloved son. God is speaking to everybody there. This one, he's speaking to, the, you know, the focus here is he's speaking directly to the Lord. Thou art my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased, right? Now, go back down to verse 14. So he, he, he then goes and is tested in the wilderness, all right? 40 days. Verse 14. Now, after that, John was put in prison. That's John the Baptist. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the, king, the gospel of the kingdom of God. His gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. And saying, now remember what Paul says, when the fullness of the time was come. Well, what time? Look at this. <clears throat> Verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, what time is the Lord Jesus talking about? He just comes to Israel and says, hey, the time is fulfilled. The question is, what time are you talking about, Jesus? Well, it's the time schedule of Daniel chapter 9. God gave Israel a time schedule. I won't go into it tonight. You guys, we'll just, be there all night. But you can read it, and we got other times when we've been in it. But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, he talks about the time. We talk about the 70 weeks of Daniel, right? And then there's these 69 weeks, and these are weeks of years. So weeks or anything, seven, whatever, okay? It could be seven days, seven, whatever. Seven, seven sevens. These, yeah, there's seven sevens. After two score, uh, excuse me, after three score and two weeks and so forth, um, well, let, let's look at it. Go to Daniel 9. Go, go back to Daniel. I don't want to, I got to make sure I got it, every verse here. Okay, yeah. I'm just going to, I'm just going to look, show you uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. We won't read all of it. I'll just, I'll just skim through it. It's a lot there. Look at the, look at the first part of verse 24. Daniel 9, 70 weeks are determined upon thy city, upon thy holy city, upon thy people in thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, that's all the kingdom, to seal up the vision and prophecy, everything be fulfilled, to anoint the most holy, that'll be the temple, and so forth. Verse 25, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, that's from Cyrus's command, unto Messiah the Prince, that's, that's the Lord Jesus, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, so there's going to be the, the rebuilding of the temple and, and, the, and the city and so forth. You see verse 25, the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. You see that in Ezra, Nehemiah, and so forth. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off and so forth, but not for himself and the people of the prince. So you get all these things going on. The point is, that time schedule of Messiah, to Messiah the prince, look at, look at that. Look at the end of verse 25. From that commandment from Cyrus to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score. So you got the 69 weeks. Okay? You got 69 total weeks. We always talking about the 70th week of Daniel. That's that last seven year period that's even future from us. That thing is yet to come. That's the seven years preceding the second coming of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. Okay? But the point is, is here. He says to Messiah the Prince, it'd be these 69 weeks. Now watch this. When the Lord Jesus Christ, so to Messiah the Prince, okay? Now, that's what he's talking about. Go back to, Matt, go back to Mark chapter 1. So when the Lord Jesus comes and say, the time is fulfilled, that's what he's talking about there. Go back to Galatians now. So when the fullness of time was come, let's keep going. Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians 4. We just put them together like a puzzle piece. Galatians 4. That's the fullness of the time. When it was time for God to send his son, Messiah the Prince. All right, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. Uh, remember Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born... A son is given. So what, whoever this child that was born, it was one that was given. God gave his son, right? 
the Son of God existed as the Word before he became Jesus, see? Uh, John chapter 1. Now, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman. Now, that's significant because Mary was a virgin. Isaiah also says, behold, a virgin shall, con shall conceive, right, and bear a, ch a child. That was a sign. So much so that Joseph was like, I got to put this woman away because she's pregnant. Then the angel of the Lord had to come to him in a dream. Now, but it's more than just Mary, because back in Genesis 3.15, the Lord says to Satan, to the serpent, he says, the seed of the woman. There's a lot of theories about this, but, but it's, 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 it's most likely that that sin nature, obviously, because Adam was a man, comes through the man. And so she was, she, even, though, even though Mary was a sinner, by the way, the, the Catholics, they believe she's co redemptive all this without sin. No, she, was, she says, she says when, when, the, when the angel came to her, she says, my redeemer. She needed a Lord, a redeemer too. Every, every sinner does. Now, he was born without sin because he was conceived by the Holy Ghost, okay? He did not have a sin nature. Now, notice what it says. God sent forth his son, verse 4, made of a woman. And that Genesis 3, 15, the seed of the woman, that's the Messiah, made under the law. Let me, let me stop right there, too. Remember I had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John under there, up there? All of the Lord's earthly ministry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of it. All of the book of Acts, all Acts, all of the book of Acts. It's Israel, Israel which Jesus Christ was an Israeli. He was their Messiah. But let me go back to his earthly ministry before he left. It was all under the law of who? Moses. Remember what he says. The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All that they bid you do, do. But don't do after their works because they say and do not. Politician like, ain't they? All talk, no action. No. Listen. He says, go and offer the sacrifice Moses commanded. He was under the law. Why do I bring this up? It, most of Christendom spent, their, their preachers and teachers spend most of their time, I'd say 90% of their time in, in the four gospels, don't they? You turn on right, I bring that radio back in here. I, I, turn, that, I turn that Christian radio on, they'd be in the gospels. They will. But they're under the law. We're not under the law. Romans 6, 14, we're under grace. The dispensation of grace happened in Acts 9. The Lord Jesus came down, saved Saul, Paul, our apostle, and he, he ushered in a new dispensation of what? Grace. We're under grace. We're not under the law, but we are under grace. So you can't go back to that to get your doctrine. The, that guy's still looking for the body of Christ. Dodie? That, that the well, that's a whole nother thing. Tell, no. tell that guy before he start talking about the rapture, find the body of Christ in the four Gospels. It ain't there. That's right. This is the nation of Israel. That's right. They're under the law. The body of Christ is under grace, began with the Apostle Paul. Amen. That's right. So, so Because he doesn't rightly divide the scriptures. It says, he was made of a woman made under the law. By the way, as late as Acts, way out here, even during the dispensation of grace, until the temple went down in A.D. 70, those little flock, those messianic Jews, the kingdom saints, the believing remnant, the Israel of God, Paul calls them in Galatians 6, they all were still under the law at temple worship. In fact, they talked the apostle Paul into taking a Nazarite vow in late Acts. And he, he did it. He was about to, because he, when he's with the Jews, he was a Jew, he's with his brethren. He was about to sacrifice the, the, the animal, as Numbers said. They just, something stopped him. But he, he was going to do it. They were, they were still under the law. The Lord Jesus never told his apostles, you're not under the law, you're under grace. Never. Now, Paul, Paul, he told the Gentile, well, he told both Jew and Gentile, you're not under the law, you're under grace. But he never stopped the Jewish members of the body of Christ, nor the little flock Jewish members, from temple worship. But what he said is, don't ever put it on any of these Gentiles, these uncircumcised Gentiles. Don't you put that law on them, okay? You can observe it if you want. Talking about the ceremonies and the feasts and stuff, if you want to. 
it's you don't need it. It's going to be a stumbling block. I, I Paul said, but he never he was gentle with them, and he let them learn. You know what he called them? He called them weaker. They called them weak. Those Jews who wasn't who weren't established who weren't established yet with their freedom they have in God's grace. Now, here's the difference though with the Galatians. Let's keep looking at it. Look at verse five to redeem. So Christ came. He suffered on the cross to redeem, to, to buy them out, buy them back, them that were under the law. That was the nation of Israel. But we, we receive a blessing from that in the, in the, under God's grace that we, the body of Christ, might not see. This is only Paul knows this. That's why he says, now I say in chapter four, verse one, go back to verse five, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, when he talks about the adoption of sons, we think of adoption as you just get someone else's child and bringing it to your home. But adoption there means you go from a little child to a grown up. You go from a servant to a son. Watch this. We're going to go look at some verses in a minute, but look at verse six. And because ye are sons now. Although the Galatians were not acting like sons in their practice. Sons. There are two ways that Paul talks about sons in the body. There's position, positionally. And practice or, you know, practically you're walking in it practically. This one in Galatians was the one he's talking about is that one because they had they had ceased doing this right here. This wasn't in operation. They were under, they weren't back under the law. But see, he still says because of the because of the grace of God positionally in Christ because of what Christ accomplished and you trust in him, his faith, the faith of Christ. Ye are sons. Ye are sons. Uh, one of our brothers tried to say, hey, he's confusing people. He's, he's, he's saying, see, the adoption is future. The sonship's a free future. Blah, blah, blah. No. Ye, I said the man just missed all of Galatians 4, the first book Paul wrote. Paul says to the Galatians who weren't walking properly, ye are sons. This stuff is not future. In fact, when we go to Romans, when he says the adoption of sons, what that what that is, just so you'll know, that means you go you go from being a, a servant or a, a a child, right, to a grown up. God treats you like a grown a child under under tutors and governors to a grown man or woman under God's grace okay that's what it means and so positionally we are sons and what we see from Romans 8 he gives us the spirit of adoption we'll go over there in a minute but here's the point you are sons even the Galatians who weren't walking practically in, in God's grace positionally there are sons now let me show you something well, now don't miss this verse no look at the title what's our title crying out before now watch this people miss that in my 20 plus, I, I have never heard any of my dispensational brothers ever mention this. But it hit me one day. I was comparing. There's three times the Bible uses Abba Father. We're going to look at them tonight. Two of them in Paul's epistles and one in the book of Mark, which we were just at. And it's a reason it's in only in Mark. And one day I'm reading, I'm looking at it. I'm saying Paul brings it up twice, but he's not saying it the same way. What do I mean? Look at verse 6. So these guys who were not walking as sons, practically speaking, were sons, positionally speaking. Verse 6. And because ye are sons, God proved it. God had sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, what? Abba, Father. Now let me, let me write what Abba, Father. Well, I can put it right there. Crying, Abba, Father. Abba Father means it, it, it has the sense of intimacy. It's an intimate term. Abba, 
By the way, in the Middle East, they still use it. It's an intimate term, both in Israel and amongst these Muslim nations, Abba. It's an intimate term. It's, it's, like, it's like daddy. Okay, it's intimacy. But it means father, my father. Father, my father. Okay, there's an intimacy, a daddiness, a, clo a closeness there. Okay, now, when the Lord Jesus Christ taught them how to pray in Israel, what's the first thing he told them to say? Our Father, our Father who art in heaven. Our Father. That was an intimate relationship they had. And what a son does, he labors with his Father. He's a, when the Lord was 12 in Luke, he says, don't you know I got to be about my Father's business? He labors. And, and by the way, look at this. Labor. What's the difference between work and labor? With labor, there's some there's some striving, and you know what? There's some suffering, okay? And that's what we're going to see, that what a son does, Paul says, as a son with the father, he's labor with me in the gospel. But there's some striving, some suffering. Now watch this. Father, my father. Paul visited it twice, okay? We're going to see. So, so now, now watch this, everybody. Look at verse 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son, over in Romans, he's going to call it the spirit of adoption. Okay? Spirit of adoption is the spirit of his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? They're synonymous. Now hold that thought. Watch this. Verse 6. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now who's crying, Abba, Father, in this verse? God has sent forth the spirit of his son, crying Abba Father. It's the Spirit crying. In Galatians, it's the Spirit of God crying Abba Father in, in, in them, in their hearts. Why is that important? Go back to Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans 8. Go over to Romans 8. Now look, the Galatians weren't walking in the doctrine of the Apostle Paul. They rejected grace and went back under the law. They weren't walking as sons, so the spirit had to, the spirit was crying, Abba Father. The spirit was the, 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 the thing operating. They themselves were not operating the way God wanted them to. But the Romans, they did. Um, go to Romans 6. Go to Romans 6. Go to Romans 6. Look at verse 17. Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of who? Not God, sin. Your sin nature. The sin, excuse me, the sin in your members. That's what he's talking about. You know, can I say something? I'm going to be real technical. And I just said it, so I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody. But really, our sin nature is in, as a believer in the body of Christ, as somebody who say, our sin nature is in our, it's in our body. It's in this flesh. You know that? God has given us a new nature. That old nature, cut off, gone, circumcised. God gave us a new nature called Christ. Therefore, when we sin, we learn from Paul in Romans 6 and Romans 7, Sin that dwelleth in me, that is in my... Well, I'll show you. I'll show you. We'll look at it. We'll go to Romans 7. Look, let, me, let me read this verse first. Verse 17. Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But something else is in your heart. See, the sin is in your members, but look in your heart. But ye have... What's that next word? Ye have what? Obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Now... Now, what doctrine is Paul talking about? He's talking about his doctrine, right? So were the Romans obeying Paul's doctrine? Yes. So the book of Romans assumes that they're walking in Paul's doctrine. The book of Galatians assumes they're not. Over in Galatians 4, it says the Spirit is crying, Abba, Father. Now, before we see what it happens in, Ro in Romans, go over to Romans 7. Look at Romans 7. I want to talk about this sin nature while we're there. 
Verse 18. Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, and I love this. Look what the Spirit of God does. You, you ever hear people say, I'm a sinner saved by God's grace. We, all, we sometimes say that. But really, that's what you used, that was when you got saved. God doesn't see us as sinners. He sees us in Christ. Now, we do sin because of these bodies. That's why God got to give us new glorious bodies, right? But look what Paul says. Verse 18, Romans 7. For I know that in me, that is in my what? Flesh. Ah. Where is that sin? It dwelleth no good thing. Go down to verse number that's a battle, but it's your flesh versus your spirit. Your inner man versus your outer man. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law or operating principle. Now, everybody look at verse 23. But I see another operating principle or law in my what? Members. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my what? Members. So I want you to remember, when you get saved, the sin is in your members of your body it's not in your nature right you have a new nature that's the thing that God is building up through Paul's doctrine Paul's going to say look I'm waiting for Christ to be formed in you so just remember I know what people say I'm a sinner saved by God's grace that's what you were <laughs> you were you are you should be calling yourself a grace believer being transformed through the mind of Christ. Because God doesn't see us as sinners. I thought about this with my daughter. I said, if I constantly focus on the things that Jada Lynn does bad, what kind of mindset is that? Am I developing in her? And say, if I'm constantly saying she's bad, she's bad, she's bad, you know what she's going to believe? Daddy believes I'm bad, then I'm bad. But if I say, now, honey, you do bad things sometimes, but daddy loves you. I'm going to stay on you, but you, I, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to train, but you're a good girl. She said, daddy knows I'm a good girl. I just mess up sometimes like everybody. You see? So God doesn't look us. He doesn't look at us as sinners anymore when we trust Christ. He sees us in Christ. Everybody get that? So if you, if you, I'm going to talk about this Facebook later. If your Facebook say, maybe I say that. I'm a sinner. I'm probably my <laughs> I'm a, go home and change. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Well, you were that. You are a saved person in Christ, growing in Christ, okay? Now, because it's in your, it's in, this stuff is not you. This is, you have a body, but you're, you, you are a soul. Now, go over to Romans 8. Now, let me show you something about this crying Abba Father. Look at verse 14. Now, Paul in Romans 8, the, the reason people confuse heirs of God and join heirs with Christ because they don't understand that these folks are walking in the truth. They're, they're suffering for the truth, and Paul's going to tell us that. Look at verse 14. Because they're reading something that's practical. As a, as they're reading a position. practical passage as if it's positional, yes. That's why, that's why they take out the, the, the... Go to chapter 8, verse 1. I've, 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 there are Pauline dispensational brethren who take who mess this verse up verse number at one there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus now other versions change that and they'll give you a little note they'll take the last ten who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit and they'll say that shouldn't be there because that's what the scholars say blah 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 I actually wrote a brother about that he says well the scholar said that I said well it does not because he, he was confused, he used it as a justification verse. And yes, positionally, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. God doesn't see you as a sinner, so you're, you're safe. You have eternal security, positionally. So that's still the wrong tool for the right job. Exactly. This is a practice verse, a pr practical verse, a walk, a sanctification this is not for justification of position, it's practice. And even men who don't take out the last ten words of that they verse still, yeah. still can do still, confusing. still use it as a practical uh, 
positional verses. That's so right. Practical verses. And, and by the way, by the time you hit Romans 8, Romans 6, 7, 8, and you'll hear people, it's weird because you'll hear them say, Romans 6, 7, 8 are the practical, the walk of the believer, right? Mm -hmm. But then they'll go to chapter 8 and, and put it back into your, your position. Anyway, here we go. Who walk not out the flesh, but out the spirit. There's the word walk right there. It's walk. It's a walk of the believer. Okay. Now, go down to just the times. Go down to verse number 14. Look what he says. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now. Now, watch this, everybody. In Galatians, this, 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 got to get this one. In Galatians 4. They were not walking properly in Galatians 4. They are the sons of God positionally. Notice in Romans 8, these are those who are led. They allow the Spirit of God to lead them. And he says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And he's not just talking practic uh, positionally, he's talking about their practice their walk as we see in verse 1. So let me get let me show you something. Galatians 4 positionally. Paul reminding them who they are, be that. Stop trying to be under the law, be under grace. Romans, they're led. They're they're walking, they're obeying the doctrine. So they're sons acting like sons, Romans 8. Galatians are sons not acting like sons. Everybody get it? Now watch the rest of this verse. Verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's the law. God has not given us the spirit of fear. You're not under the law. But ye have received the spirit of adoption. Now, the spirit of adoption, Paul calls that in Galatians 4, the spirit of his son. What's the adoption? It's when the servant becomes a what? Son. The spirit of adoption, spirit of his son, that's when the servant becomes a son. Okay? Whereby we cry what? Abba, Father. Now, in Galatians 4, because they weren't walking, it was the spirit crying. In Romans, because they are being led of the Spirit, it is we cry. It, it's those who are obeying. It, they're crying. It. You see that? They're crying. They're walking in obedience to God the Father. These people aren't, but the Spirit is, he, he's, he's telling them, come on, get with the program. Get with it. And by the Spirit of God in them, in Galatians 4, crying out the Father, and by the Word of God through Paul getting inside them, it's trying to make them do it. The Spirit and the Word are saying, come on, get with the program. Everybody got that? All right. Now, the third time it's used, which is really the first time. All right. Now that we're talking, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the king, the servant, the man, and the God and God. We've been talking about the spirit of the son, spirit of adoption, going from servant to the son. So of the four gospels, the, the, the term Abba Father is only mentioned once in one of the gospels. Of those four, which would be the most likely which 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 would be the likely book that you would see something going from a servant to a son? Mm -mm, that's God servant the book of Mark this is my beloved son it's the book that shows him as a servant becoming a son okay so just remember that if you're ever looking for that third Abba Father which is really the first one it's in Mark okay let's look at it let's go to Mark uh, Mark chapter 14 towards the end of it's at the end of the Lord's ministry and, and if you're not familiar with Mark, um, it shows him as a servant. You know what's interesting about Mark when you read it? See, my wife does things fast. She goes, you know the best one for you to read there? The book of Mark. Because it just gets going and gets to working. She tells about her job there at Target. They love her. 
Because the department she in, you got to be moving. <laughs> She'd be sweating. She'd come home. You know, she'd be ready. Boy. But Krista's perfect for it because she's got a lot of energy. She's moving. That's Book of Mark there. And when you read it, it just goes, and this, and this, and straightway, straightway, straightway. It doesn't even give you a, a genealogy. Luke goes through the whole genealogy from you know, all the way back to Adam, right? Yeah. No, nah, you don't want Luke. I want Luke. I like to, nope, my wife, that's Mark. And this and that, and boom, straight way, straight way. It's moving, boom, 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 boom. He, in fact, servant don't need a genealogy. The, 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 the genealogy, uh, he don't need a genealogy. It says, the, let's, how does Mark start off? Look at Mark start off there. He be moving. How Mark start off? The, yeah, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, son of God. Y'all, any questions? Let's write that's it boom he, he, he says that and then next thing you know you and John the, by the way you and John the Baptist ministry Luke at least tell you where John came from Elizabeth and Zachariah you know they, I mean Mark is just like let's get on with the program Mark is the third book he's a three just okay. boom, 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 boom. there you go that's right one two three it's probably all lined up to them we'll see now and this and that and that. Now, go to Mark 14 at the end of his ministry. This is uh, as he's about, he's going through his passion. He's, he's, um, he might even be in the, in, the, in the olive press there. Let me see. Is he in the garden here? Yeah, I, I'll have, as Ryan in a minute about, the, about that garden, that olive. Uh, ver verse 32, Mark 14, verse 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. What were you saying about that, Ryan? That's the olive press, right? The Gethsemane. Gethsemane means olive press. Yeah. The press, olive press. It's where his life is going to be squeezed, man. Mm -hmm. And the spirit produced. And the spirit, sunshine in the bottle. That's <laughs> what it produced, baby. I like that. You squeeze that out and do. I guess it's just like a picture that. Like, Oil. It's like the Holy Spirit. Right, yeah. Hard times happen and you can respond right, with strength, oh. right? And weakness, yep. right? The and Holy it, Spirit responds. The right? Holy Spirit in him. Now watch this. Look how. When he's in his garden, look what happens. Look at verse number 32. And they, uh, this is Mark 14, 32. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, the olive press. And he said to his disciples, sit ye here while, while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John. Those are his inner circle, the inner circle, the 12. And began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And said unto them, by the way, that sore amazed and very heavy. Y'all understand that's his humanity there. He was, he was a man. He was God and man. Verse 34. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch. You ever notice that even the Lord Jesus Christ needed others? Everybody needs somebody sometimes, the song says. Even the Lord Jesus. He, you know what? In those times, he just needed his friends with him. And all he said is, y'all just stay close. I want to look over and be able to see you. I'll be right there, but have my back, bro. You know what they did? If I remember, they fell asleep on him. Yeah, they did. <laughs> that was nighttime. Yeah. That's all right. You know, he looked at him. He says, y'all can't stay. Ah, forget it. You can't stay away. Forget it. That's all right. Yeah. Go to sleep. Verse 35. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that. No, no, no. Everybody get this. That if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Listen. Even Jesus, and I'm, I'm calling him reverently Jesus because it's humanity. It's not like he wanted to be separated from the, God the Father, God the Spirit. Okay, He's a, He was sacrificed, but he, he was human too. He was like, if, if there's any way that this might pass. Verse 36, and he said, Abba, Father. Father, my Father. All things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what? But what thou will. I, I wrote myself a note. That's a son's prayer right there. That's a son's prayer. You, you, know, you know in the context of Abba, Abba Father, there's suffering. Suffering. We can't get into tonight. These Galatians... Were, 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 they had suffered for the truth and then they stopped. Paul says, have you suffered so many things in vain, right? But God didn't give up on them. The spirit is crying, is crying, saying, come on, work with me, suffer with me in the truth. Suffer with me. So in the midst of suffering, the father, he says, oh, my father, 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. You know, ultimately, what Abba Father means? I am willing to do thy will, O Father, even in the suffering. That's what it means. Abba Father means I am willing to do thy will. Now, if the Spirit is crying in this Galatians, the Spirit is ready to do the will of God, right? They weren't. Because guess what? Even if the Spirit is willing to do the will of God, you have what from God? Free will. You have volition. And you can choose not. Oh, Paul says you obeyed. So here's the point as we, as we come down in. Crying out the Father three times. In the book of Mark, the servant turned into the son. You see the Lord doing it. He was in the olive press. He's about to give his life. And the spirit of God, the olive oil is going to come out. Oil of olive coming out. He's willing to do his will and suffer for the father. The Romans, they cried out the father. They're saying, we're willing to suffer with you. Now, go back to Romans 8. Let's end over there. That's where the next passage in Romans 8. They cry out the father. Romans 8, 15. Look at verse 16. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. Hey, same thing that the spirit was doing with the Galatians, but they weren't getting it. The spirit is crying. Now watch this. The spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. We are positionally we're heirs. We're heirs of God. And joint equal share heirs. We haven't had that rewarded inheritance. Joint heirs with Christ. Not with Jesus, not with the Lord. Christ, you're going to suffer. If so be, that's conditional, that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. The glorified together has to do when he's coronated in the heavenly places. We're going to reign with him. When you think that glorified together, think reign together. Hey, to be a joint heir with the suffering one, you have to cry. You have to cry. Abba, Father. You have to be willing to suffer under the will of God. And today is suffering for the mystery of Christ. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. That is what qualifies you to cry, Abba, Father. You're saying, Father... I'm willing to do thy will. Just like the Lord Jesus. I, I wrote myself a note years ago. When I look at that, I wrote, that's a son's prayer. Not my, not my will, Father, but thy will. That's what it means to cry out a father. And the only way you can do it is to walk with him in his will. What's the will of God today? To make known the mystery of Christ. And if that's what you're walking in, you're doing that. Now, it's a lot of things under that umbrella, how you... How you, how you take care of the doctrine, how you treat your brothers and sisters. You'll be judged at the judgment seat. But ultimately, are you willing to suffer for the mystery of Christ? The spirit is in you crying. You, you, as we end, you, you know what I think about denominations who are saved, people who are saved? You know what Paul is saying? The spirit, the spirit is constantly in them trying to motivate them. It's crying out to them. To the Father, through them. That tells me God wants them to see this. If the Spirit is constantly crying out through these denominational believers, He's seeking to do the will. That means if you're not doing the will of God, that's your, that's your choice. You're fighting God. Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Remember that? Galatians 2, how do you frustrate God's, well, you just, you hinder him by, exactly, not obeying, ignoring it. I would not have you be ignorant, brother. That's right, that's right. Dodie said ignore it. You're ignoring this truth. Don't ignore this truth. Don't ignore this truth. That's why we exist, where the Bible's here, and we exist to help people understand. Every Sunday and every other Wednesday, we go verse by verse through Paul's epistles. Don't ignore it, Okay. Uh, speaking of don't ignore, uh, it all starts with salvation. If you, if, you're not, if, if you don't have that joy of everlasting life, that's why we exist. Now, God wants us to be together in a fellowship. Next time, we, in two weeks, we're going to show where Paul says, I would that I was present with you all. 
And I, was, I brought Krista over and I was looking at that verse. I said, Krista, come in. Because it hit me. Paul's going to say, I'm telling y'all all this, but I, I need to be there in person to talk to you because that's what God made. It's, it's, it was awesome. Right there, we just, I'm just looking. His first epistle, he says, I, I desire to be with you in person because I, I, just writing you is not the thing. I got to see you. I got to, I got to say it in person. Well, also by that statement yeah. that they would be gathering together. You got to gather together. That's right. That's just, so I feel for those who can't, who doesn't have it. And thank God for our brother Ryan that gets these out. But this is a blessing we have to meet with one another, to touch and hug and talk and so forth. We exist as a ministry to help others. So if you, if you don't have anyone, we appreciate you all watching our ministry, learning and growing. We hear from you all the time. But um, ultimately, what God wants is us for us to fellowship together. That's, that's the best for everybody. So we'll be here for you. And hopefully uh, there are those who are, who, are, who are out there who have the ability to come and be a part of, of, of the grace ministry here. But if not, we thank, we're thankful we can even help in this, in this small way. All right, we'll help you get as full reward as you can, okay, in your situation. The righteous judge will, will um, work all that out at the judgment seat. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you for his truth. We thank you that he was the first to cry, Abba, Father, not my will, Father, but your will. He was willing to suffer for your truth, Father, to Israel. And it's no coincidence that Apostle Paul uses that same term that the Lord Jesus used as he's going through his passion to speak to us in the body of Christ. The Romans were willing to suffer with him. The Galatians at that time were not. They had. They stopped. And we pray that many of them recover themselves before they die to get a reward, to recover themselves. But, Father, let us redeem the time that we have. Let us cry out, Father, and walk in your will and obey your doctrine through the apostle, and through your rightly divided word. We thank you for this, Father, and we ask you uh, to bless, bless our time. Let these things um, take root in our hearts by faith. And let Christ be formed in us. Let us bring forth the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. Let us develop the mind of Christ, Father. We thank you for this um, glorious privilege in his wonderful name. Amen.